Hello, Telesur English presents a new episode of China Now, a way media production that showcases the culture, technology and politics of the action giant. This episode goes over China's intelligence networks, China's attendance to the latest uh, BRICS uh, forum in South Africa, as well as its environmental security policies uh, facing Japan's discharge of water from the Fukushima nuclear power plant and other topics of interest. Let's see. China Current is a weekly news talk show from China to the world. We cover viral news about China every week and also give you the newest updates on China's cutting-edge technologies. Let's get started. Hi, welcome to China Currents. I'm Chris. Two weeks ago, we reported that China had arrested a CIA spy. The suspect, whose last name is Zhen, was an employee at a state-owned military corporation. He was lured by the CIA during his stay in Italy and continued to provide critical information to the CIA after he went back to China. We talked about how rare it was for Chinese authority to pinpoint the name of a foreign agency and how China's new anti-espionage law had affected the foreign agency's operation within China. Well, the show is not over yet. On August 21st, Chinese Ministry of State Security announced that they had captured another CIA spy. The suspect, whose last name is Hao, was arrested for spying for the CIA. Hao was government official at a critical department who had access to classified information. While he was studying in Japan, Hao was approached and recruited by the personnel from CIA. At that time, Hao was only an employee at a non-confidential department. So the CIA persuaded him, using money of course, to apply for position within core government departments. And Hao signed the espionage agreement with the CIA and went through multiple assessment and training sessions with the Americans. After returning to China, he continued to have secret meetings with the CIA operatives, provided them with intelligence and receiving espionage-related funds in return. China's newly revised anti-espionage law, which came into effect on July 1st, urged to fight a people's war against foreign spying agencies. In order to safeguard national security, any citizen or organization that discovers espionage activities should promptly report them to the National Security Agency. It would be quite interesting if we compare two spies. In terms of similarities, both of them were recruited while studying abroad. This is actually a pretty good sign to national security, isn't it? Meaning it is hard for foreign agencies to recruit within the Chinese border. Good work, boys. As for differences, the spy arrested this time, Mr. Hao, was actually trained by the CIA after agreed to become a spy. On the contrary, the first guy had never gone through the entire CIA curriculum for spying. This is a problem because our new guy was working at a much more critical government body, where the first guy was only an employee at a state-owned military company. But seriously, since all of you will eventually get into that cell, what difference does it make? Well, these spying cases also help netizens to understand a protocol for civil servants. Traditionally, once someone gets a job as a civil servant, he or she needs to hand in the passport. Civil servants, especially the ones who work at crucial departments and those who make it to cadres, will go through a strict procedure before going abroad. People used to consider protocol as redundant and unnecessary, but as the Ministry of State Security began to review all their spy cases, netizens have expressed their understanding towards a policy. Next up, on August 19th, the Eastern Theater Command of the People's Liberation Army announced that he had organized joint sea and air combat readiness patrols around the Taiwan island, conducting joint exercises involving naval and aerial forces. According to the report from Taiwan, a total of 45 PLA military aircraft and nine warships were observed operating near the Taiwan Strait. Among the 45 aircrafts, 27 crossed the so-called middle line. Notably, the Eastern Theater Command also released a video of the exercise. Undoubtedly, the aim is to demonstrate the joint combat capabilities of the theater's forces, sending a strong warning to both separatists and foreign countries that engaged in provocations and collusion. The military exercise is a reaction to Lai Qingde's earlier visit to the United States. Lai, a politician affiliated with Taiwan's Democratic Progressive Party, arrived in New York for so-called transit on August 12th. 
Lai used his brief transit in New York to garner support for his separatist agenda from the United States. Meanwhile, China's Taiwan Affairs Office also started its investigation into trade barriers set by Taiwan Island, which probably lead to an end of the ECFA, the trade agreement between the mainland and the island. On August 21st, China's General Administration of Customs suspended importing Taiwan's mangoes. According to the official announcement, citrus millibugs have been found on mangoes from the Taiwan island in recent inspections. The suspension is made to prevent further damage to the mainland's agricultural production. On Chinese internet, many consider the suspension as a warning to the Taiwan separatists. Next up, let's take a look at the BRICS. On August 21st, Chinese President Xi Jinping left Beijing for the 15th BRICS summit in Johannesburg, South Africa. A total of 69 countries, including all of the African countries, have been invited to the summit. The Chinese president previously visited South Africa in 2018 as he sought to enhance China's diplomatic and economic ties with Africa. BRICS is an acronym for the developing countries of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. The BRICS countries represent 43% of the world's population, 16% of the world's trade, and a larger share of the world's GDP than that of the G7. Most of the netizens in Chinese social media expressed their expectations for 2023 summit and hope that more strong economic measures will be proposed to boost the economy. On August 24th, the BRICS agreed to admit Iran, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Argentina, Egypt and Ethiopia to the organization, marking the second expansion in the organization's history. The group was originally formed in 2009 by Brazil, Russia, India and China, South Africa was added in 2010. Chinese President Xi Jinping called the expansion historic and said it will bring vigor to the group. Chinese netizens expect BRICS to play a role in resolving national and regional disputes and the admission of new members could guarantee China's stability in accessing oil resources. Next up, let's focus on the nuclear disaster in Japan. On August 22nd, Japan declared its intention to commence the release of nuclear contaminated water from the devastated Fukushima nuclear power plant into the Pacific Ocean. In response to this announcement, China expressed vehement opposition, labeling the act as extremely selfish and irresponsible. Vice Foreign Minister Sun Weidong summoned Hideo Tarumi, the Japanese ambassador to China, to formally express China's concerns and objections regarding this decision. Sun emphasized that Japan's decision blatantly disregards the firm opposition of the global community. He further warned that if Japan persists with the discharges, China will take all necessary measures to safeguard the ocean, ensure food safety, and protect the health and well-being of our citizens. During a regular news briefing in Beijing, Foreign Ministry spokesman Wang Wenbing reiterated China's concerns, urging Japan to rectify its decisions, engage in sincere communication with neighboring countries, responsibly handle the contaminated water, and accept stringent international oversight. In a related development, John Li Ka Chu, the chief executive of China's Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, announced an immediate ban on importing Japanese seafood products. The Macau Special Administrative Region also declared a ban on importing live and fresh food products from the 10 Japanese prefectures and regions effective from Thursday. Following the two SIRs, on August 24th, two hours after Japan began dumping dump nuclear wastewater into the Pacific Ocean, China's General Administration of Customs announced the suspension of all seafood imports from Japan. The agency said the measures aimed to prevent radioactive contaminated Japanese seafood from entering China and protect the life and health of the Chinese people. Chinese customs will strengthen supervision of food imports from Japan. Previously, China had banned seafood imports from 10 prefectures in Japan, including Fukushima and Tokyo, but allowed imports from other prefectures if they passed radioactive testing. The latest import ban now encompasses all of Japan. Next up, on August 22nd, the Chinese ambassador to Myanmar, Chen Hai, met with the Thai and Lao ambassadors to the country to discuss and coordinate efforts in tackling local gambling, telecom fraud, and trafficking in the border region. The urgency of this collaboration stems from the increasing prevalence of telecom frauds, particularly those originating from northern Myanmar. 
Furthermore, the region near Myanmar's border has become a hotspot for human traffickers who deceive unemployed youths with promises of lucrative overseas jobs and poses a serious threat to the lives and property of the peoples in neighboring countries. The embassies of the three countries in Myanmar have expressed great concern and are continuously working on addressing this issue. The embassies are fully coordinating with Myanmar authorities to conduct search and rescue operations and assist in intensifying efforts to combat gambling and fraud syndicates. The challenge now is to ensure that this region does not continue to serve as a safe haven for criminals. Next up, on the morning of August 22nd, North Korea's Air Koryo landed its first international commercial flight in Beijing, marking the country's reopen after three years since the COVID pandemic. The flight was set to take off a day before but was cancelled at the last minute, and a fluctuation was regarded as a sign of indecisiveness. Discussion on Chinese internet focused on what has made up Kim Jong-un's mind. Some connect this to the recent typhoon Kanun, which passed through the entire Korean peninsula. Storms and floods ravaging the land might have proven detrimental to North Korea's food production, forcing the country to call for a helping hand, especially from China. Others associate this with the military alliance between China and DPRK, which just consolidated as DPRK commemorated the 70th anniversary of the Korean War armistice in high profile. By reopening its border, North Korea seeks to increase its defense tie with China against a more aggressive U.S. force in the Korean Peninsula. Well, that's all for today. Thank you for watching this episode of China Currents. If you have any thoughts and comments about our show, please reach us at the email address below. I'm Chris. Looking forward to hearing from you and see you next time. We will go for a short break now, but we'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to China Now. This second segment explores new scientific development to turn carbon dioxide into sugar, as well as how, how it advances the new techniques for water forecasting. Also, in a new segment, experts put side by side both China's and U.S. housing system. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Lisa, and this is Threshold in China. Today, we are going to share some exciting tech innovations and announcements that happened in China last week. On August 24th, Japan started dumping radioactive water from Fukushima into the Pacific. Experts estimate around 1.5 million tons of contaminated water has accumulated so far. Discharges may continue for 30 to 50 years, affecting the entire Pacific region and beyond. This has raised global concerns about health and environmental impact. The stimulation results revealed just how close the Fukushima contaminated water is to us. Radioactive material would appear off China's coast about 240 days after being discharged. They would then spread down China's southeast shores, reaching the US and Canadian west coast in around three years, with some appearing along the north coast of Australia, covering almost the whole North Pacific. The radioactive materials will then rapidly spread southward along the Americas carried by the equatorial current while also transferring into the Indian Ocean via northern Australian waters. With levels building up over time, eventually concentrations would be higher along North America's shores compared to the most of coastal East Asia. To present a clearer comparison, researchers selected three coastal cities, Misayaki in Japan, Shanghai in China, and San Diego in the United States, and graphed the tritium concentration changes in nearby waters. Notably, although contaminants arrived later in San Diego, the stable concentration levels there eventually exceed those in Misayaki. Around 4,000 days after the discharge begins, contaminant concentrations near San Diego are already higher than most of East Asia's coastal regions, roughly three times Misayaki's level and 40 times Shanghai's level. 
The reason for this phenomenon is that strong ocean currents near Japan carry most contaminants eastward across the Pacific rather than southward along the Asian coastline. Although Japan has claimed to the public that the issue is only regarding tritium, many scientists worldwide share the consensus that the contaminated water contains up to 64 types of radioactive elements, over 70% above safety limits, which are difficult to fully process with current technologies. Back in May, the plant operator Tokyo Electric Power Company found that black rockfish have 18,000 becquerels per kilogram of cesium-137, with 180 times over the legal limit. They also confirmed that a total of 44 fish with cesium levels above 100 becquerels per kilogram had been found in the Fukuyama's plant port between May 2022 and May 2023. The effect could be long-term, as we have mentioned previously, this charge may continue for 30 to 50 years. The accumulation of radioactive materials over such a long time is uncertain. China and Russia has suggested an alternative plan for Japan to consider, which is evaporative mission. That refers to the method of evaporating contaminated water with radioactive tritium and releasing it into the air. They argue aerial emission would have less regional impact and monitoring methods are technically mature. However, Japan rejected this proposal mainly based on the higher cost of evaporative missions. The first batch of 7,800 tons of radioactive contaminated water is currently being discharged into the ocean, a process that will continue for 17 days. We will keep following this developing story and in our next episode, we will provide an in-depth analysis on the consequences of Japan's way of disposing the Fukuyama's contaminated water and to what extent it will affect each of us. Chinese scientists have successfully converted carbon dioxide into sugar. Sugar production has always relied on plants, but crop yields face increasing risk from climate change impact like land degradation, ecosystem decline and extreme weather. Securing sustainable sugar feedstock is becoming a challenge. In September 2021, researchers at the Tianjin Institute of Institutional Biotechnology synthesized starch from carbon dioxide in the lab. In less than two years, on August 16, 2023, they successfully converted carbon dioxide into sugars. The team established a modular chemical enzymatic cascade to transform carbon dioxide into hexose, which is a simple sugar with six carbon atoms. Common hexos are glucose and fructose. The team had successfully produced four types of sugars. The full reaction took about 17 hours, reducing sugar production from years to hours compared to traditional crop extraction. The yield was 0.67 grams per litre per hour, over 10 times higher than previous bio-based efforts. Leading author Yang Jianguang said controlling different enzymes enables theoretical synthesis for almost any sugar type. This precision will be key for high-value food, pharmaceutical and biomaterial production. In future, the team want to further synthesize other types of sugar for applications in food, medicine and biomanufacturing. Maybe one day scientists could even turn air into a meal. This past July may go down as one of the hottest months ever recorded, potentially in 120,000 years. As climate change accelerates, extreme weather like hurricanes, typhoons, floods and droughts are becoming more frequent. Improving weather forecasting accuracy can better safeguard lives and property, especially when typhoons make landing. Study shows reducing the 24-hour typhoon pass prediction error by just 1 km decreases direct economic losses by around 97 million yuan. However, reducing typhoon forecast uncertainty has been a slow process, with global medium range scale improving only one day per decade. Before ChatGPT exploded, powerful computing, massive datasets and deep learning were already combined to build sophisticated weather models. For example, NVIDIA's ForecastNet 
DeepMind and Google's Graphcast Microsoft Climate X, but recently attention has focused on China's Huawei and its Pangu weather model. The Pangu weather model is a 3D high-resolution global forecasting AI system exceeding traditional numerical prediction accuracy. Two months before appearing in Nature, it accurately forecasted Typhoon Mawa's change in its past five days out. By training deep neural networks on 43 years of global data, Pangu surpassed legacy method in both precision and speed. Previously, stimulating a typhoon's 10-day pass took five hours across 3,000 servers. Now, with the pre-trained Pangu and AI inference, more accurate forecasts take just 10 seconds in one server and GPU. With immense computing power, Pangu can predict the hourly or the week's global weather in seconds, and it is 10,000 times faster than before. The key innovation is its 3D Earth-specific transformer tailored to graphic coordinates for processing complex 3D weather data. Unlike 2D models confined to pressure level, Pangu 3D architecture better captures ocean, atmosphere, and land interactions. Pangu has proven itself forecasting extremes like February storm, Eunice, and UK's first 40 degrees Celsius temperatures. It has the lowest error compared to the European and American agencies for predicting typhoons. Pangu is now on the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting website, offering free 10 day global forecasts. Recent tests showed Pangu outperformed the center's model on accuracy metrics and extreme weather prediction. As the next typhoon approaches, it is hoped that more people can say we are prepared. This tree is the tallest tree newly found in Asia, the Tibetan Cypress 1, at 101.2 meters tall. This photo is taken by drones and it vertically combines hundreds of shots together. And it's the second tallest tree in the world. After the 115.9 meter Hyborion Coast Redwood discovered in California in 2006. Tibetan Cypress 2, found alongside it, reached 99.5 meters. The Chinese team discovered this groove in Tibet, with the world's highest altitude. Over 260 trees exceeded 80 meters, with 25 surpassing 90 meters in this biodiversity hotspot. Judging by diameter and rings, researchers estimate Tibetan Cypress 1 is about 1,450 years old. Tibetan Cypress 2 is around 1,400 years old. So how do they get so big and can they keep growing taller? Botanists define giant trees as over 90 meters. Researchers said the tallest tree live exclusively in wet, humid, temperature climates. The groove where these giant trees were found is a cloud forest with annual rainfall of 1,500 to 2,000 millimeters. And this is important because for trees above 60 meters high, it becomes increasingly difficult for them to obtain water that is transported upwards from the root. So it relies on the moisture that branches and leaves directly obtain from fog and rain. While not skyscraper heights, these giants are biological marvels and living fossils. There are many ecosystems. Tibetan Cypress 1 and 2 host 46 epiphyte species, which are plants that grow on other plants. Birds and numerous insects also spotted by the team. And that is all for today's Threshold. As always, please let us know if you like this news section on science and technology in China, and we will do more in the future. Welcome to Overlap, brought to you by Breakthrough News and Wave Media. My name is Rachel Hu. I'm happy to be joined today by Xiaofeng Ma, a content producer on Billy Billy, as well as Will Merrifield, the director of the Center for Social Housing and Public Investment. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Hello, nice to meet you. 
Nice to meet you. <laughs> Great to have you both on. So I want to get started in this conversation with opening up about the question of homelessness, which I think is really interesting. Today we're going to talk all about the ways that housing exists in China and the way that housing exists in the U.S. And I think in the as the U.S. is in the midst of a housing crisis, there is a lot for us to dive into. So, Will, I'd love to hear from your perspective. What is the systemic issue of homelessness in the U.S.? What causes homelessness? And generally, what are people in the United States feeling uh, about the impending housing crisis that continues to loom? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a big question. Um, you know, in the United States, there's about 582,000 people that are experiencing homelessness right now. That number is probably low. Of that 586,000 people, about 60% of them reside in temporary homeless shelters and the rest sleep in the streets. The reason why I say that number is low is because the way in which homeless people are, you know, calculated, the way in which we try to account for them is municipalities, so cities across the country have these things called a point in time count, where they literally have volunteers go out and count people on the streets. So they never count, you know, all the people that are on the streets. And furthermore, aside from people who are actually experiencing homelessness in the United States, especially in our coastal cities, there is a, a lot of housing instability. So you have people who may not be technically homeless, may not be in shelters or on the streets, but they're couch surfing. They're going from place to place just trying to you know, stay off the streets. So the problem in the United States is, is really staggering. I mean, in the last few years alone in the United States, the situation has been deteriorating. I mean, I can just tell you on a personal level, you know, I work in Midtown, I, I work in Manhattan, and the homelessness issue has certainly gotten significantly worse. People are struggling. People are, are just on the streets with nowhere to go. And the city has done very little to do anything about it other than put more money into police and really that has not done anything other than given the police more money to harass people. It hasn't helped people. It hasn't translated into people getting housing or homes or anything like that. Really, what can you do in a short period of time is really go to a shelter. That's all you have. And what happens if you don't get into the shelters? I, I know in Alaska, actually, the shelters recently were moved outside. They got rid of the last shelter in Anchorage, which is horrific to think about because they moved everybody to a campground and they were actually being a attacked by bears. There is, as you said, an affordable housing crisis. As to the causes of that crisis, I would say, you know, post 2008, which was the financial crisis caused by the collapse of the mortgage industry, housing has increasingly become financialized in the United States, which is ironic because what caused that 2008 financial meltdown was the financialization of the mortgage market. So instead of learning from that catastrophe, which resulted in one of the greatest transfers of wealth um, from the 1% to the 99%, instead of learning from that, we've in the United States have doubled down on a hyper-commodified profit-driven um, housing system. And just to give you, and you know, this isn't just the United States, this is globally, especially all across Western Europe, um, to give you a little context, the global value of real estate was $326.5 trillion. I believe that was in 2021, which is four times global domestic product. So you have all this capital flooding into global real estate markets in the United States, flooding into these coastal real estate markets, and it's driving rents through the roof. Recently, Rents in the United States, the average rent surpassed $2,000 a month for a two-bedroom apartment. You just have, I think, a hyper-commodified housing market, which drives rents crazy because the people who are investing in this housing are institutional Wall Street investors. And what the reason why they're investing in real estate is to maximize profit. So what gets built in the United States is things that are extremely expensive, and is not rationally related to what is needed from workers on the ground. So you have luxury apartments being built in a place like Washington, D.C., which is going through a huge affordable housing crisis. We're publicly subsidizing the building of these luxury apartments, and we're not building housing 
that people really need. We're actually tearing down the affordable housing and privatizing our public housing stock to cater to these global investors who want to invest in very expensive housing. Certainly well. I mean, I'll say this about the U.S., which I think is an important point, too, which is that a lot of these landlords who own luxury housing, they warehouse it. I mean, not just luxury housing, public housing, affordable housing, rent stabilized complexes here in New York are warehoused by landlords, meaning that 88,000 different units here in New York, literally that are are rent stabilized and affordable are taken off the market on purpose. So that way landlords can make more profit. And that's, uh, I think, a microcosm, a little bit of the system that we have. Even if there is something affordable, it's really not in people's hands whatsoever. So a lot of people definitely fear deeply homelessness as the crisis deepens, which is certainly an issue here. But Xiaofeng, I wanted to ask you about homelessness in China. I'm really curious to know is homelessness a, an everyday experience for people in China? Do you see a lot of homeless people in China? And it, what is the government doing to alleviate homelessness or help with the issue? Mm, to be honest, I was shocked the first time I saw so many homeless people in the U.S. online. I mean, in today's China, it's not usual to see homeless individuals, but uh, it doesn't mean that they don't exist. Based on my personal observation, the number of homeless individuals in Chinese cities is uh, relatively low. In current China, homeless people refer to those who don't have a fixed abode, who cannot rely on their relatives or friends in the big cities, and uh, difficult to ensure their basic food supply and accommodation. It's not like the peasants who lost their lands in ancient agricultural societies. They have uh, different problems. The homeless issue in China was largely attributed to the urbanization since the 21st century. And uh, these people could be divided into different uh, categories. Some have uh, mental illness or physical disabilities, usually caused by tragic accidents and it changed the life of whole family. Apart from this, the homeless population is mainly made by another group, which is migrant workers who left their homes to earn money in the cities. When I say migrant workers, I mean domestic immigrants. Uh, it means uh, people from less developed uh, regions moving to more advanced places. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, one of the things that I'm curious about in China to, to go a little deeper into Xiaofeng is this idea of migrants coming from the countryside into the city. Because that's, well, that's a thing that happens in the U.S. I know it doesn't happen to the extent that it happens in China. So I'd love for you to share more about this because I know people in China back home in like the small countryside often own land or have family land. So I'd love for you to elaborate on this. Yes, yes. China has been an agricultural society for thousands of years. After the reform and opening up since late 1970s, there are still much more farmers in the population. The income from agricultural activities is often very limited while in their hometown. The secondary and tertiary industries do not have many job positions. So they choose to make money in the city. When it comes to homeless issue, we have to talk about domestic immigration because the main part of homeless population in China is urban workers or domestic immigrants. Uh, this is a historical problem originated from the reform and uh, opening up policy. At that time, uh, with the rapid industrialization and uh, urbanization, uh, a lot of rural labor migrated uh, to big cities for more job opportunities, better education for their children. They don't expect to meet unemployment issues in big cities. So when they fail to find a job or suddenly lose their jobs, they could go back to their hometowns anytime. So um, housing and uh, renting became a huge burden at that time. But in the following two to three decades, we went through a housing reform. It has increased the supply of the uh, commercial housing. Before this reform, housing was catered by the government. However, housing supply is still limited because of the limited resource. So 
with the increase of the number of houses, a significant number of people with stable incomes bought homes in the cities, and it is much less likely to be homeless. Uh, on the other hand, those who couldn't afford to buy a home, as long as they have a job, they can afford to rent at least. I'm not saying that uh, we don't have unemployment here in China, but uh, it's not that difficult to find a job that can cover your daily costs, including the rent. For those migrant workers who are experiencing unemployment, we have this urban shelter system to provide temporary shelter and uh, support. Or they can choose to go back to their hometowns. The train tickets are covered by the shelter. According to the recent data, the number of people assisted was over 3.48 million in 2013. But by 2021, uh, it had reduced significantly to 830,000, which is a huge progress. Most of them have their own self-built house back in their hometowns. So they have a place to go if they fail to earn a living in big cities. There is a historical reason behind as well. During the land reform and the establishment of the hukou system, uh, we basically uh, ensure that uh, rural families could get a small piece of land on which they could uh, build their own house. The rapid economic development also contributed a lot to solving this problem. It released a large number of jobs opportunities. Almost everyone benefited from this process. So I was wondering what are the main factors lead to homelessness in the US? What is the role of your government played in this? Will, feel free to jump in and answer that. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Um, so. There's this perception in the United States itself, and also I think globally, um, I want to really pound home, you know, the idea that the cause of homelessness in the United States is not primarily due to mental health issues or drug addiction. It really is a cost issue. So just really quickly, in Washington, D.C., the average rent for a two-bedroom apartment is about $3,200 per month, which works out to about $39,000 per year. The um, minimum wage in Washington, D.C. is about $33,000 per year. So right away, there's a $5,000 gap between what a person working a minimum wage job in Washington, D.C. earns and what they have to pay in rent. That is before they paid for transportation costs, before they bought food, before they bought their kids clothes, you know, cared for their children. So, and in the context of this affordable housing crisis in Washington, D.C., we are tearing down the public housing and we're giving away massive amounts of public land and public money to politically connected developers to build luxury apartments that people can't afford. So just really quick, between 2002 in 2013, in Washington, D.C., we gave away $1.7 billion worth of public subsidies to private developers. And in that time frame, and we gave these public subsidies to private developers because what did they do? They promised that they were going to build housing that people could afford and that they were going to create jobs. So what we saw during that time frame was that half of the affordable units in Washington, D.C. were lost. And while half of the affordable housing units in Washington, D.C. during 2002 and 2013 were lost, high-end units tripled. So what these developers were doing was they were taking public subsidies, they were tearing down affordable housing, and they were replacing that affordable housing with more expensive housing so that they could maximize their profits. And that is what is really driving the affordable housing crisis, not only in Washington, D.C., but in municipalities and cities all across the country. 
Will, I really appreciate that. I think that's an important point. But I'd love for you to talk a little bit more, Will, about the situation for home ownership. Because I think one of the things that's really important about the market right now in the U.S. is that especially young people really look at the future and say, I don't think I could ever own a home, which was always a big, you know, sold as a big part of the American dream, that you can own your own home, you can have your own backyard, white picket fence. And that's really not the, re uh, the situation now, especially for young people and millennials who are now pushing 40 um, who will not be able to own their own homes. So I'd love for you to speak on, on, on this experience and this situation and, and kind of the outlook for what a lot of people feel for the future. Yeah, sure. I mean, home ownership is, like you said, Rachel, it's out of reach for a lot of young people in the United States. In the United States, um, you know, debt, our, our economy is built a lot on debt. So a lot of students are graduating college in obscene amounts of debt. If you go want to get a degree beyond a four-year university degree, then you get into more debt. So it's a debt trap because we're told that you have to continue your schooling in order to get a job that you can earn enough money to buy a house. However, the longer you stay in school, the more debt you accumulate. On top of that, the as we've been talking about, the commodification of the housing market has driven not only rental costs, but housing costs, home purchase costs through the roof. In Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, the median home value just surpassed $1 million. So think about, and I will say that the, the median income in the United States, I believe, is about $44,000. So just think about that. Um, there is very little space for people to be able to you know, afford homes in this market. Um, and what does that do? It drives more people into the rental market. And what does that do? It drives up housing costs. Um, so you can see that the system in the United States is, uh, it feeds into itself. And the people that are benefiting from all these different things that we're talking about is Wall Street is the big banks because they own these assets and they are, you know, they're getting rent from us and we're not able to purchase, we're not able to own. That's the situation in the United States. And I think that it's important to complicate that question of homelessness. So Xiaofeng, I'd love to hear your thoughts on some of this and, and learning more about the housing crisis in the U.S. I have an impression that uh, the big companies Big capitalists are highly controlled by the U.S. government. Um, for example, you have very strict anti-monopoly laws. But what you just said made me feel that the Wall Street could basically do whatever they want. It seems that they could push up the house pricing unlimitedly. In China, when talking about the housing problem, uh, usually it refers to purchasing an apartment uh, rather than renting one. Because here in China, as long as uh, you have a job, no matter how much you earn, at least you could find a shelter. That's the main difference between the US and China. For Chinese people, the pressure is mainly from actually buying a house for ourselves. Although we don't have that much homeless population, we are still on the way to solve the housing problem. Although the housing reform has largely increased the supply of uh, commodity housing, it also caused some housing problems. For example, the pricing of housing was pushed up and up and up. Under the Chinese culture, newly married couples must own an apartment. So you could uh, imagine how much pressure is on uh, young people nowadays. In order to purchase a home for the new couple, at least six pockets would be empty in Chinese family, including the pocket of the bride, the groom, and the, both of their big families. Uh, when it comes to housing price control, uh, it's a bit complicated here in China. The central government always uh, pursue uh, to control the housing price under an adequate level, uh, but for local governments, as land transaction is their major income source, uh, they have great interest in the housing industry, you know. 
However, if they keep doing this kind of transaction, they will make the housing price up and up and up. So basically, there is a contradiction between the central and the local governments. As a result, uh, in order to mitigate this issue, the central government is taking various different measures to control the housing price, including providing low-rent apartments and uh, so on. You know, one of the things I'm thinking as we're having this conversation is just about where we see this crisis going. Yeah, it is uh, a dire situation right now. It seems as though the only solution that elected officials have in the United States is to throw more public money and more public land into the private market to private developers. And the idea is that they'll build, build, build. And at some point there will be a trickle down effect and rents will come down. But what we've seen in reality is the opposite of that. The more public resources that we shovel into the private market, the more rents go up. There are a lot of sophisticated reasons for that. But um, I think the, you know, you had talked about earlier, landlords are, or developers are building apartments and strategically keeping units offline to keep rents high. There was a really interesting ProPublica study um, that just came out about a month ago that talked about a specific algorithm that especially Wall Street owned housing projects are using that tells them when to keep housing off the market. So we're giving our public money to the private sector and we're saying build housing so rents come down and they're building housing to increase their profits and they're actually raising rents. Over There's been a huge housing boom in Washington, D.C. Um, and over the last 10 years, rents have risen by 55%. So what we can plainly see is that what we're doing is not working. However, there is there are movements across the country. People are fighting back. Tenants are organizing. And one of the most um, hopeful things that I think is, is happening in the U.S. is this growing idea of this concept of social housing in the United States. And social housing is the way I think about it. There's actually a bill in Washington, D.C., right now that calls for the building of municipally owned mixed income housing that is self-sustaining and pays for itself. And the way it works is that government looks at housing as infrastructure, it builds housing, unlike traditional public housing where it was only very impoverished people that were able to live in it, this sort of public type of public housing has a mix of incomes, and because there's a mix of incomes in the housing, the rents paid are able to cover the operating cost of the, the apartment complex. And the surplus rent at the end of the month, the rent that's left over after all the tenants have paid their rent and the place is upkept, that surplus rent is actually used to pay down the construction cost of the housing. So this model is a decommodified outside the private market, a public form of housing that allows housing to be accessed by a broad spectrum of people. And I think would do would, would provide in essence a public option for people. So if they don't want to be exploited by the private market, they could rent, they could choose a public option and um and pay much less rent. That model is based on the model in Vienna, Austria, where that's a municipality of about 1.9 million people they have 420,000 units of social housing. Half of their housing stock is made up of social housing and about 80% of their population qualify to live in that social housing. So they've removed the stigma of public housing. They've made this public housing extraordinarily popular among their residents. So the government can't cut funding for it. Um, and they've created a public option to drive down costs. And I think that in order to solve the affordable housing crisis, we, we're going to have to look to decommodified forms of housing. Like I said, there's a public housing bill that is proposed in Washington, D.C. There's one that's been proposed in California. There's public housing or a social housing bill that's been proposed in Maryland. I know there's a growing social housing movement in New York. So I think that there are, you know, hopeful, hopeful things um, into the future. But I think what's important about the United States is to understand that these things are going to have to happen 
at a municipal level in cities across the country, because what we see from our federal government is that they're not ready for the moment. They're not prepared to take on Wall Street and banks. And in order to grow these alternative housing models, I think we're going to have to do so through local organizing um, in cities and municipalities across the United States. But it's happening. Certainly, Will. I really appreciate your insights. And I, I think just what I want to end this conversation on is just drawing off of what Xiaofeng was sharing about the Chinese model. I, I think it's just important for people in the United States, especially, to look around and see that there are other options. I mean, it's really exciting to think about drawing on these different models that incorporate, especially for where we are now in the U.S., options for public housing, social housing, and really building the, into the idea, into the consciousness that we have the right to a home. Can I just make one last point? Yes. I think, especially for the audience in the United States, I want to drive home the idea that Wall Street and hedge funds are not going to save us. They are not going to solve our affordable housing crisis because their model is to extract, is to extract wealth from the working class and give that wealth to the 1%. What we need is public investment, public investment from our government, our government using our tax dollars, using our public land to invest in public institutions that build strong communities. Because the, 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 the increased financialization, it is wholly dependent on Wall Street and hedge funds, and we will only dig ourselves into a deeper hole if we continue to rely on that model. Awesome. Thank you so much. And this was another episode of China Now, a show that opens a window to the present and the future of the action giant. Hope you enjoy it. See you next time.